something irks me in the fitness industry. And this month, it is the oversimplification of fat loss to calories in versus calories out. Let's face it, there's a lot of coaches out there and a lot of them want eyes on them. I hate to say it, but I do think the industry is getting stupid by the day. Genetics has a massive component on how big we can get, but not how lean we can get. For any coaches that are listening, I think understanding the role of leptin has on, you know, appetite control and, you know, metabolism, I think that's crucial to understand how it affects overall calories in, calories out. For coaches that let, let go, oh, well, this is really complicated. And yeah, yes, it can get complicated. What is the stuff that generally solves this issue? So every now and then, I get on the sort of like rants of the month. Something irks me in the fitness industry. And this month, it is the oversimplification of fat loss to calories in versus calories out. I'm not an anti-calories in versus calories out guy, quite the opposite. But I've seen it at the expense of health far too often these days. So the question I want to we're going to name the show and the question I want to ask to you is, is the fitness industry getting dumber? Well, maybe we should discuss it before we um, determine if they're more stupid or not. Listen, let's face it. There's a lot of coaches out there and a lot of them want eyes on them, whether it's online coaching or one-to-one -one coaching. So there's a massive push on marketing. And and what gets views, what get what gets eyes, what's what's getting clicks. <clears throat> I hate to say it, but I do think the industry is getting stupid by the day. I hate to say it, but I yeah. think so. Well, they're certainly acting that way anyway. What do you think? Acting acting that way is the key thing, and this is the thing I can't quite work out because you we it it is nuanced and middle ground doesn't get clicks and eyeballs, as you say. And let's take, for example, someone on the opposite side of the spectrum, like a Paul Saladino, right? That people often criticize for his um, slightly more tribal claims of like, kale is bullshit and all these vegetables are going to hurt you, which I think people dismiss too quickly. I don't think that most people struggle with vegetables, but I do think there are people that do have issues with yeah. plant defense chemicals and seed oils and and we can go, I'll come back onto the seed oil point later and sort of like um pesticides in food. And no one would question someone with a nut allergy and going, well nuts are healthy. You should just eat them. But we we, we call people that have this with vegetables and autoimmune conditions stupid, which is another rant for another day. But if you look at his content, Yes, he's very polarizing. The biggest, like, tribalistic parts of himself come out on Instagram and YouTube shorts. But if you ever listen to Paul Saladino, believes in calories in versus calories out, he's not carnivore anymore. He's open to change his mind. He goes into his blood work. And if it was like that, I don't think this oversimplification to calories in versus calories out would bother me. If, if I generally thought that people were like, they, they understood all the, the, the logic on health and inflammation and nutrient density and all this sort of stuff, but they were just sort of making it simple because their clients are beginners. I'd feel better. Not happy, because I don't think you should be telling your clients to eat Krispy Kreme donuts instead of olive oil, for sake of example. But I just don't think it is, because I look at some of these people and go, not that I want to get them into an intellectual debate with them, but if, if I got into a conversation with these guys about the topic, I think they, they, they break very quickly. And that's not saying that I'm smart because I definitely don't think I am. I look, I look to other people in the industry for, for yeah. validation after time. It, but it, it, I feel that the, the basic understanding of health has been lost in this vague of, well, it's just calories in it. And then their education stops. I don't need to learn anymore. It's just calories. Lay Norton oh, says it's calories. Right. So it must be calories. All right, cool. Well, what about, okay, let's take fat loss. Yes. What is the, the, the underlying principle behind fat loss? Calories in, calories out. No argument. Okay. Have you ever had a client whom that hasn't worked with, worked for? Um, the, well, the easy answer is no. <laughs> however, 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 um, it's because there's more to calories in versus calories out than what people say online. 
So yeah. if someone is losing weight, right, even if it wasn't, even if like the, we changed something that wasn't calories, mm. if they've lost weight, they've been in a calorie deficit. Correct. Indeed. Irrefutable. How many but calories I, I, on the fat? Yeah. And then also that's, that's a very shaky, you know, there's no like real, yeah. people try to hunt for where that came from. Yeah. And there's, 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 there's nothing. No, no, no. <laughs> if you look at bomb calorimeter studies, that's not the case. But we've all adopted this 3,500 calorie yeah. rule. Yeah. Um, and I use it. I use it with yeah. clients. And I, I use it with clients in the logic of that if, if someone goes over the calories, it's the fuck it button. There's 3,500 calories in a pound of fat. So if you take where your calories are, bring that up to maintenance, then add 3,500. That's what you need to have in a day to get a pound of fat on, to make people feel a bit better. But it's yeah. a number plucked out of our ass. Like five fruit and veg a day. Yeah. It's a number plucked out of our ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the thing, isn't it? Like, you know, like, there's a lot of mathematics behind it, right? You know, it's mm. a lot of mathematics behind it. But you're right. Like, you know, what are the sort of con considerations against, to argue against calories in versus calories out? Is you know, metabolism, variation, nutrient composition, hormones. That's a big one. Gut health. What else is there? Gut health. I mean, gut health is a big one. Yeah, like if we start looking at like, because everyone's, I feel like always, you know, people who are, I don't want to say naive, because there's very smart and driven coaches that don't understand this. And that's fine. Like, I'm not saying you, you need to understand all of this stuff. I just think like, it's, I, it was a point in time where I didn't understand any of this stuff. Yeah. And I went and looked into it and I've invested a lot of money in my education to learn more about this stuff. So I, if you feel like you don't understand this, I'm not calling you out. I'm, I'm more calling out the people that don't want to learn and have oversimplified yeah. it and are yeah. telling their average clients to, to forget health is, is in the, for the sake of abs is, is yeah. Bonkers. Bonkers. but when you look, people go talk about this, the TDE total daily energy expender, right? And you go like, we've got 60, 70% of it's BMR. Then we've got thermic effect of food. Then we've got um, neat. Then we've got uh, exercise, right? And everyone, and everyone then focuses on that last like 30 to 40%. So we look at neat for sake of argument. People consider it as steps. It's not steps. It's, it's fidgeting. It's now we blink. It's the things we tap. It's and just, just to our voice. And just a quick, um, you know, from my experience on, on that neat side mm. of things, I've got two brothers who I work with. And um, one has um, ADD, ADHD, sorry. Mm -hmm. And um, they have a very similar diet and a very similar activity level, except one just is, one is obese and one is skinny. He's always yeah. moving, moving, as, you know, moving. And, and, and that, that's what neat is. Okay. And that's what neat is for anyone that's listening. You know, you know, he's moving all the time. You know, he stays. That's a really good analogy. As, as, as skinny as a stick, but the other one is, you know, he's obese. You know, the, and, and when we look at the genetic, they're one year, they're one year apart. They have very similar lifestyles, very similar um, stresses in their lives, very similar um, nutritional habits, exercise habits, um, everything very, very similar. Right. The biggest difference is one of them just always fucking moves because he has ADHD. And he and honestly, one of them, the obese one, is about 125 kilos. The skinny one's probably, I don't know, 60. So say double the fucking weight. Double the weight. That that like, that's 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 crazy analogy. And when we look at genetic differences in fat loss, right? And people go, is is it, like, are people genetically predispositioned? to have higher body fat levels? Is it nature versus nurture? Mm. Well, I think everyone has the everyone has the ability to get in shape and lose weight. Yeah. I, I, I don't think genetics stops us doing that. Genetics has a massive component on how big we can get, but yeah. not how lean we can get. Yeah. However, however, there are massive genetical differences, which is a, slightly another topic for another day. But when we look at NEAT, people, people, one, have naturally higher NEAT levels and like you like those two people and two people have more of a genetic predisposition to how much they um when they go into a caloric deficit how quickly then it drops as a preservation tool yeah. so some people may keep fidgeting and hyper all the way through their diet and other people may immediately slump 
like immediately as soon as they go into a deficit. So when people talk about neat being steps, it's more like, well, my goal is never going to be, hey, Steve, this week I want you to fidget 20% more, please. But if we know that's going to happen, me giving you an extra 2,000 steps just sort of addresses this balance a little bit. And then we have the thermic effect of food. That's just the big stuff, right? If we eat less food, we have less calories. Um, so less calories are being expended, right? Like, I don't care how much protein you're having. If you're eating less food, you're expending less calories digesting the food, right? Um, we offset that with a bit more protein and things like this, to a degree. And then exercise, this is the one we often play with. And people go, it's like 10%. And it's, it is, but at the yes. same time, it's, it's not worth worrying about too much. However, I have definitely think, think, things, people talking about the um, energy flux, things like this. I have definitely seen people move more, get far better results than people who move less. I have also seen, um, when it comes to activity, people say that, you know, like building muscle isn't actually going to increase your metabolism that much, right? So like weight training is not going to do too much in a, in a diet. We shouldn't train for fat loss. We should train for... Uh, muscle preservation of not building. And it's like, well, a lot of that studies are done by metabolic rates of people sitting down. Mm. So it, it's the, don't everyone start doing fat loss workouts. <laughs> but if I train for muscle gain and I put on ten, five, 10 pounds of muscle, right? I may only burn, and this is, these are numbers plucked out my ass. These are, these are my 3,500 calories of the day. Um, but you might burn 200 calories extra sitting down but you might burn considerably more than that moving that metabolic tissue yeah every day for the more steps and the more cardio that you're now doing um but this is the 30 to 40 percent no one talks about the 60 70 percent of the total daily energy expender because what they just think of it as is coma calories which is like You've got this huge chunk of stuff that you can play with and like optimize. And yes, it's not trackable in the same way that steps are. But you telling me that we've got 60 to 70 percent. If our gut health is in a poor, poor position, we're not absorbing nutrients well, not absorbing um, calories well. Our thyroid conversion, part of it's done in the gut. Okay, so that's going to bring down the metabolic rate. Our liver, 15 to 20 percent of our metabolism. I'll bring down our metabolic rate, right? Um, the amount of body fat we've got on our body, right? Eventually, if you're really overweight, could cause leptin resistance. Means your body, your brain is thinking that you're really lean when you're not. That's going to affect our metabolic rate and our appetite. And we can start seeing here, and that's just three things of many things, how we've got this sort of, like, uh, to steal a phrase from Metabolic Mental University, who I'm studying with at the moment, this almost dynamic system where the stuff under the hood has a major impact on how many calories we expend. Gut health, really, really important. Obviously, um, the gut microbiome will definitely influence how calories are absorbed, right? And, and metabolized. So, you know, one person may have a healthy gut, someone else may not, may have a poor gut. So, you know, that will certainly impact your calorie absorption and how you, you, you know, assimilate food. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, unless you're getting tested, you don't know, but there are some simple signs, right. You know, um, how easily do you get bloated? How often do you go to the toilet and, and, and numerous things, right. There's a lot of different things, you know, but I mean, you know, we know there's a lot of, uh, neurotransmitters, um, you know, in the gut, you know, they, they say the gut is the second brain and they say, you know, you know, there's that saying, I've got a gut feeling about this. <laughs> well, it's true because I think 90, 95% of your serotonin is producing the gut. And it makes its way up to the brain and it's how you think, right? And well, that's another know, important point, right? Because if, if, yeah. if your serotonin is affecting your mood, your mood will affect your decisions. Your mood will affect what you choose to eat. Your mood will affect your diet compliance, yeah, right? Yeah, like, yeah. And, and sure. like people are just saying to People are just saying calories in versus calories out. Well, yeah, but we're only affecting that calories in part. We're not optimizing for calories out. And it is yeah. the equivalent of just saying to someone who wants to train, progressive overload. But you don't tell them what exercises yeah. do, what reps, what sets, what the execution and, is. And, and, it's just a term. 
And that's the thing. You can imagine what you said about the serotonin, about how, how it's affecting how we think. Then you've got to think, okay, if that's the case, what about all the other psychological factors that come into with that? So emotional well-being and how it influences other hormones like cortisol, like mm. ghrelin, you know, that those impact appetite and how the body stores body fat as well. So, you you know, why don't you go on to leptin? Do you want to explain what leptin is and sort of why that's important? Yeah, like I, you mentioned I, did, an episode, I did an episode of Rob a while back where um, because people think of leptin as a hunger hormone and it's not. Leptin is a the body's gossip queens. That's the way I've always described it, right? So leptin is a yeah. is a hormone that's stored in your adipose tissue, in your fat cells, right? And it will communicate to the brain and basically take the piss about how fat you are. So the more leptin you have, the more little gossip queens are going to your brain and go, <laughs> Simon's really fat. And the brain's like, God, I don't like this gossiper. So what he'll do is he wants to get rid of some of that leptin. So he'll ramp up somebody's metabolic rate and upregulate thyroid right? And bring down ghrelin, as you mentioned, which is our sort of like master hunger hormone, right? And NPY, which is another one, right? So we lose some of this leptin. In the reverse, if we get really lean, and now there's less body fat, then there's less of a leptin signal going to the brain. And the brain sort of goes, oh, do you know what? I kind of miss those gossip queens. I've got no one to talk to. So it slows down the metabolic rate, upregulates ghrelin to ramp up your appetite. So you find that sort of like safety spot of like body fat where you like to sit your set point if you will but the problem comes when someone becomes morbidly obese like any hormone we can talk about this with insulin we can talk about people yeah. this is less resistance with the adrenals but people get a bit yeah all over the place with it that when we look at like, every time people get leptin resistant and that's like there's like yeah. leptin gossip queens are having a party and there's tons of them yeah. but your brain it's like, I'm not listening. He puts his noise cancelling headphones on. He shuts them out. And after a while, he's like, no one's talking to me anymore. Yeah. And he assumes that we're really lean. So he slows down our metabolic rate, upregulates our appetite, but we're not really lean. He's just not listening. Mm. And that's where we get these issues of our metabolism being slow, despite us eating tons of food to stoke the metabolism. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's it. Like that, that's that's a really good point you made there about you know, and the more body fat you have, you know, the more um, you know, the the more leptin, the the higher the leptin levels go. Correct. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, because it's made in our body fat stores, which, which in theory should suppress appetite and increase energy expenditure, but that doesn't exactly happen, right? Because of the potential of um, you know leptin resistance or signaling pathways and things like that, right? Is it producing a hypothalamus? Yes, or yeah. it's, it's made. Doesn't it come from? Does, isn't it produced in um, fat cells, but sort of signals a hypothalamus or something yes, like that? Yes, yes, right. yes. So, yeah, so leptin's in the fat cells. The hypothalamus. Yes. When you ever look at hormones, it the it nearly always is a hypothalamus pituitary like yeah. sit like organ sort of uh, pathway. So the way I always explain that to, to my students is like, I, I'm terrible at American football, apologies for any American listeners. But if you imagine the hypothalamus like the coach, right? He puts the game plan together. He gets all the information, right? And he puts this fantastic game plan together. He will speak to his captain or his quarterback, which is the pituitary. And the pituitary's job is to make the game plan work. So he'll throw the ball to his wide receivers or his halfbacks, which in this case is going to be your pancreas your uh, adipose cells, your adrenals, your, um, your testes, whatever the play is going to be. And if that is working, the coach got a good game plan and getting the right information, the pituitary's throwing arm is working fine, and like the pancreas is running in the perfect line, then the chance of you winning against a good opposition goes up. Like being, having, um, being able to eat more food and still be in a caloric deficit because everything is functioning well. Whereas... Yeah. If the hypothalamus is getting bad information and all of a sudden the, the, the pituitary's arm's not really feeling good and then the, the pancreas and the adrenals and the adipose tissues um, are literally just like making bad lines, yeah. we lose against worse opposition, which means yeah. we're still, it's still calories in versus calories out. But there's some things yeah. at play here why one guy's calories can be 500 calories more than the other person's calories. That's more than just neat 
thermic effects of food and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I think just off that leptin, like for coaches, for any coaches that are listening, I think understanding the role of leptin has on, you know, appetite control and, you know, what you said there and metabolism, I think that's crucial to understand how it affects overall calories in calories out hmm. equation and its impact on body weight. But seeing as that we're talking about leptin, why don't we talk about how it has another hormonal interaction with um, ghrelin? Mm -hmm. Do you want to explain what ghrelin is? Yeah, well, ghrelin, ghrelin is essentially is a hunger hormone, right? It's what's going to ramp up a hunger. So when we said about leptin talking to the brain, and because we're, let's say we're too lean, let's say we've gone on a diet, that the body's not listening to, like, the, he doesn't get many le much leptin signals talking to him. So he'll release ghrelin and MPY, which is responsible for ramping up our appetite and turn down our metabolic rate, turn down our thyroid. And we find this middle ground. On the flip side of this, if we're overweight, right, um, we, we want to ramp up, we want to sort of like bring down our appetite. So we bring down the levels of ghrelin in order to address this. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and just to add to that, like ghrelin is primarily produced in the stomach. Mm -hmm. And as you said, stimulates that appetite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and like for coaches that they like go, oh well, this is really complicated. And yeah, yes, it can get complicated, but the like it's it's being aware of this stuff. You don't even need to understand this unless you want to read blood work with your clients or something like this. You don't really need to necessarily understand all the intricacies of this because what is the stuff that generally solves this issue? Managing stress, you make your stress gut, managing the allostatic load. Fancy name for stress. Um, working on sleep. And if you want to work on how to sleep, then me and Steve have done an episode about how to do the best sleep. So go listen to that. An awesome episode. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, it's, it's, it's just going to be, it's going to be staying hydrated. It's going to be making sure you're, you're not nutrient deficient, right? It's going to be making sure your gut health's in a good place. It's the basic stuff that you do, but yeah. you, it, it's, it, but the important thing as a coach is to be aware that these things do matter and not yeah. pass it all off as well. I could just eat ice cream, but eat less of it. Because if the gut goes to shit, if the stress on the system goes to crap, if you're inflamed chronically, right? And, and here's a big thing, right? That when it comes to inflammation, people go, well, studies say this. And I'm like, okay. And we've done another, plug in our episodes, right? We've done, a, we've done an episode on um, is evidence based a load of crap, right? Which is the one, as, as, as of recording, is our latest one that came out. And another problem with studies, and certainly in nutrition, is that studies in nutrition have horrendous adherence, so you don't really get great um, feedback on them because even the people they are used, we know with clients their food diaries aren't always what they ate. And we've also got to add to the fact, if I said to you, we're going to do a study about exercise, health, and fat loss, who are you going to get? You're going to get people who are into this stuff. You're going to get trained individuals, metabolically healthy individuals, and often young students. So when you start looking at these things, you go, well, Yes, the data says this. The data says this thing doesn't matter, right? But then when you start looking at people in, you know, Mary, who you've got in front of you, is 46, yo-yo dieted for the last 20 years, and all of a sudden things aren't working anymore, you're going to feel the science has failed you. And you've not spent the time looking at any of this because you've just been on, no offense to Menzel Hensman, because he's amazing, but there's all your education is his Instagram page, then... Right, you, you, you're going to be stuck and a bit of a loss. Whereas if you can understand and appreciate you things and go, well, maybe what's under the hood is the thing that's making the biggest impact on calories in versus calories out. And let's yeah. maybe start giving this some attention. And, and, I, and that's sort of the, the big thing with regards to this sort of stuff is that it works. The basic stuff works until it doesn't. And yeah. if we start telling people, that they, the worry I have is that we start telling people it's, no simple, it's as simple as a maths equation that we're going to get more people that maybe lose weight in their 20s and struggle in their 40s because they're doing it through Pop-Tarts and ice cream and all this sort of stuff. And maybe they could do a bit of protein because they, you know, we're told that protein's good. That's at least one thing. But the same coach that yeah. tells you that protein is good, right? And, and, and despite calories being the big thing, is ignoring all the other stuff, yeah. which yeah, is silly. madness. I think that yeah, you're right. I, and like, I totally agree. I've got the same ideas, philosophy as you like, <clears throat> however, you know, like the mathematical side of things is a good place to start for mm -hmm. some. And on the other, 
hand, depending on who you've got, it's not the best place to start, right? We might just say, all right, drink this much water, eat this many fruits and vegetables, try and eat this many meals of protein, right? Like a simple precision nutrition sort of, sort of, um, you know, guide. So it really depends on who you're working with. Again, it depends, context, situation, client. Um, and we as coaches have to understand it all so that we can take what we want and then advise it to the client. But we need to understand all these different things. Um, yeah, yeah, interesting. I, I think another important one is, is, is um, you know, we spoke about the hormones and, and stress, sleep patterns, all that sort of stuff, emotional well-being, all that stuff and hormones. But environmental factors, mm. what do you think about that? How that impacts calories in versus calories out? Then when you talk about environmental factors, are we talking are we talking things that knock people's adherence, like social situations, or are we talking things um, like toxins? Um, maybe a little bit of both. I'm thinking more around surroundings. I'm thinking about access to healthy food options, socio-economic yeah. uh, sort of factors, societal norms, eating, you know, you know, eating habits, lifestyle choices, that sort of stuff is what I'm thinking. Yeah, I mean, they're, 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 I think they're both really important, right? Like, I think in the fitness space, I do think the conversation around, it's not perfect, but I think the conversation around our environments as regards to access to food is a better conversation because people are trying to find strategies and solutions for that sort of stuff because it falls into this, it's only calories, so here's a strategy for your nights out. Here's a strategy for your yeah. lunches. But I, I, I did a, um, an episode again with Rob. Um, I'm plugging the, our own podcast. Normally I plug everyone else's podcast. So now you're plugging our own. It's great. Um, where we talked about nature versus nurture. Is it genetics? And I go, well, like I said earlier on, while genetics plays a little bit of a role, I think everyone can get lean. Where I think the nurture component is huge is that yeah. our upbringing, if you lived on a farm where you grew your own food and you have a na you have a nice taste of vegetables because you've been bought on them as a kid and you that if you want to go to a local shop it was a walk away you'll have a much easier time losing weight than the kid who was brought up in the in the sort of inner city london who didn't have much money who had 300 delivery options and hates vegetables right that that is a the, the both people need to drop calories in order to lose weight. But if you're going to give this person the same level of empathy, you're going to fail because one's had a much harder time. So there's definitely yeah. that component to it, which is, uh, and then the other thing we mentioned the liver earlier on being 15 to 20% of someone's metabolic rate. Now I'm not going to go all pull check and tell people to, you know, change their air fresheners and their shower gels and make sure the water is filtered or, uh, make sure they never ever use a plastic container or a bottle ever again. Having said that, it doesn't mean these things don't have an impact, right? The yeah. and I don't I don't have stats at the top of my mind, but like the the, the I've I've read some recently with the course I'm doing at the moment, and the stats on the chemicals and toxins that are in our food, that are in our products, is scary. The ones that have been proven proven to be, and when we talk about carcinogenic, we're not talking coke zero carcinogenic levels which is less than our mobile phones we're talking genuine harm that people companies find loopholes to keep in products so i don't think like 90 percent of the time when people are losing weight it's not because their shower gel is toxic but I, I i do think when we if we start having people have real bad symptoms and gut health issues and things like this like delving in, in the main stuff isn't working there is a time and a place to start looking at what's the what's the healthiness of someone's liver and whether yeah. that is using certain supplements, whether that is sort of working on certain detoxification pathways. This gets a bit more complicated than most coaches need to know. But whether that's the case of looking at some of their environment stuff, this stuff is is it's it's the last tool, but it's still something to look at. And and, and here's a key point, I think, for any of this, if a coach just listeners is, is a bit overwhelmed with the stuff they now have to go and consider and learn, is that anything that is more than just I've eaten too much food will come along with a symptom, yeah. right? Blood sugar control issues will come across hypo or hyperglycemic symptoms. Thyroid issues will have energy, big, massive energy slumps, cold extremities, right? We, if we have gut issues, it will come across with 
not going to the toilet, I'm bloating, digestion, irritable bowel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Toxicity issues will probably come along with a lot of gut issues, right? Maybe some skin issues, maybe some mold issues, right? Um, but like, like, if you have symptoms alongside no weight loss, that's when you might want to start diving into this stuff because the thyroid doesn't go. I'm going to turn down the weight loss bit, but I'm going to do keep everything else working fine. Does it, if, it, if, it, if one symptom happens, all the thyroid symptoms happen. So I just want to caveat this. And I think like bringing this sort of back and round together, it, I think this will get me a bit of hate. I There's think, a helicopter flying over my I house. Know, I, can see, I can see this. It's the calories in, calories out police coming to take you away, mate. Um, but to, bring this, to bring this sort of round, I think that like that they... When it comes to this, I think this is where the fitness industry and feminism have a lot in common. Because <laughs> it's an overcorrection. <laughs> right? We, we've gone, we went so far down the specific diets, the low carb, the gut health route, that all we're seeing now in the industry is people going, fighting back. People going, well, it's going to wreck your relationship with food. Right? So we don't want any of this. And while this is true, and I, I, don't, I don't agree with the over uber strict, you can't have anything you love forever diet either. I don't think the answer is going so far in the other direction that we're telling people to sacrifice their health for their mental health. Because eventually one will knock on the other. A properly good relationship with food is finding your middle ground between those two extremes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's it. And as, and as coaches, we need to understand the overarching principles, different diets, hormones and everything that we've discussed and then with the individual their experience their goals what they want to achieve select and advise something and it doesn't mean they're always going to be on that right we, we tweak as we go we experiment as we go and it's a it's an ongoing process for them about learning where they want to be and the sacrifice that they want to take to achieve where they want to go with it right yeah and i tell you what like i, I i'm not really taking on many online clients anymore and I've noticed when I have taken a few on that like my systems aren't what they used to be for online coaching because I've been so focused on, on mentorship and I will be for, for a little while longer. But at some point I want to, I want to delve back into the coaching because I want to be able to showcase what stuff, what power, what this stuff could do. And when I do to counteract this and to be able to sort of really put this stuff into practice, I'm probably going to charge a much higher ticket than I used to because I, I, I rather than just doing the, what every coach does and just does the weekly check-in, a lot of this stuff and be able to get through to the client with this complicated stuff is having conversations and finding out where people are at. And I don't want a weekly call either, but like having something where maybe you check in a little bit less frequently when it's necessary, but you have a bi-weekly short call or a monthly short call. So to go like, okay, how's the training going? Are you recovering well from this? Do you want more sets on this exercise, less sets on this body part? How's your gut feeling? And like, because... I, I, I do find that the sometimes where this calories in versus calories out thing has come from is that coaches aren't really having these conversations. They get a check-in where clients maybe aren't comfortable talking about their gut health. And yeah. the only thing you can really do on a check-in is either ask more questions and hope your client gets back to you or drop the calories. So I think we need to be able to find easy and scalable ways to be able to communicate more with clients on an individual level. And I don't think that's an easy thing to do. And I think this is me going from knocking coaches to empathizing. Is that I think if we found that if clients had more, if coaches had more conversations with their clients, they'd understand that their clients are more than just a maths problem. Yeah, for sure. For sure. For sure. I think um, asking a lot of questions is important, but asking the right questions is more important. I agree. I yeah. agree. You know, like we, we, we often tell our coaches that it, it, there are two kinds of questions that you can use, right? If you want to push someone towards an answer, right? You want to sort of say, right, we need to make an adjustment or right. This is the, the you, there's an obvious problem. Like you're eating too much on the weekends and you're, you're being a bit of a fat fuck, right? I use the, this or that question. Hey, I noticed that, we're not losing weight this week and you're having 12 meals out per weekend. So what could you do to bring us in line with the targets that we set or do we change the goal? But then the open question 
is when we're trying to find information. And open question is really hard to do back and forth over WhatsApp or a question asked in the middle of a check-in video. Yeah. So you don't get the information that you need. Yeah. And it's got to be a better way of doing this. Yeah. I think, it, it, you know, it just goes to show the level of um, coaching, teaching, education that you're providing for these coaches and the, the depth and the analyses that you're giving. You know, I mean, it just shows you that you're a very high level coach and what you want from your coaches is a very high level of expertise for their clients, which is, it's not very common in our industry to get that, is it? Coaches get lazy. They make money online. They think it's easy. They just have too much churn, whatever, get a new client online. There's millions of people out there to work with. My biggest fear, my biggest fear with this industry and the way it's going is that more people get into the industry to make money and less people get into it to help people. And the worry that I have with that is that we're gonna see more and more people caring less about the clients. We're gonna see more people becoming more unhealthy because we're just giving template diet plans out, just telling people to stick to it and just, just calories and dropping and crashing people. And because people- but like care. I said before, yeah, but like I said before, when it gets to that point, you're gonna be charging a very, very high rate. Hmm. And for people to work with you, it's not gonna cost whatever it's going to cost which is good for me lot. right but not for the average consumer that wants to lose weight and no, they're going to get a bad service and potentially no, be because we have the impact as fitness professionals call it inflation yeah we have the impact of fitness weight inflation and financial inflation okay. we, I, char I, I, I charge i charge you a pound for every pound on your body <laughs> um like the like i i yeah, I, I think that, that that's that's the thing that worries me. Like, like it's, maybe it's good for me that I can charge a premium down the line, but I, I, I it's that situation where I want people to be able to get help, and I feel that the industry is kind of failing them at the moment because people more care about their own bank balance than their clients. Where if they cared about the clients and invested in the client knowledge, their bank balance to a degree would take care of itself. Now, am I the finished article businessman making millions a year? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But I tell you what, it's been a long time since I've properly struggled financially. And that is it, and that's because of what I the quality of what I do and the knowledge that I've invested in. So it, it it the you won't go broke if you're a good coach, right? And then the business skills can make you a rich coach. If you are someone that doesn't become a good coach, you might get rich for a short period of time, but you're always in fear of going broke. Correct. Yeah. And, 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 and I believe that you can say something like that because, you know, you've moved across the world t twice and um, you've made it work. Yeah. You know what I mean? You've made it work. You've fallen on your feet. That's because of the years of putting effort in and, and studying and getting results and being keen and eager to be the best and deliver the best. Yeah. yeah. So for, for people that want to learn more, I know I appreciate we've, we've, I've, 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 I've taken a lot of this this episode but you've asked some really good questions that have got me off on tangents but for people that want to yeah. learn more about yourself and want to learn more about what you do and what you offer and how you bring this nutrition understanding and, and practice with your lack of caffeine and perfect sleep routine alongside some amazing strength and conditioning right. knowledge 86 days 88 days without caffeine no wait i got wait wait i'm saying this wrong i've got 16 days before i leave to come to london which means i've done 84 days of no caffeine, no tea, no coffee. That's mental. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of mad, isn't it? It's kind of mad. Right? Yeah, we'll, uh, you we'll, can find we'll me at Stephen Cunningham. At 100 right? days. We'll do an episode at 100 days. And, uh, yeah. and then see, see like how you feel. Like the results of Steve's 100 days with no caffeine. I may never drink caffeine again. <laughs> right man this has been awesome right. man where are we finding you steve collins training at youtube and instagram correct indeed yes steve collins training awesome man mate it's been a pleasure as always All right. catch you next week yes thank you thank you thank you for listening to the self-made podcast if you're like me and like binge watching podcast episodes click here to watch our latest episode or if you want to stay in touch and find out when the next episode goes live click here to subscribe to the channel